So I'm Ken O'Neill and my job is I'm a government statistician and I'm a professional member of a couple of organisations, one of them is IMA and also GSS, Government, government Statistical Services. Now, when you're looking at me, you, you might think, hang on, mate, are you a statistician or are you a mathematician? Well, my job is statistician, but I have to tell you, I'm a mathematician at heart. So on the next slide, I'm hoping that this gives you some indication of what a government statistician does. Now, it's a very varied role. And I could be involved in statistics, obviously, that's what I do. I could be involved in maths, it could be economics, it could be psychology. There's a raft of different areas that a government statistician could be involved in. And each particular area has its own kind of responsibilities, key responsibilities. They're very different, they're not the same at all. And on the next slide, I'll try to give you a broad idea of my responsibilities. You see there, there are three key areas and most of them are related to my skills as a mathematician. Part of my job is that I have to collect, process and also analyse data. And the second one that you will see there is that you really, really have to think about solving problems in an analytical way. And the third one you see, it's in a different colour. I've done that on purpose because I think that's the most important skill area. Because part of my job is to find out the best available methods and recognise, <coughs> excuse me, application to standards. So that's really broad areas of my responsibility. And the pathway for each area of um, work within government for a statistician are very, very, it's very different. You could be working in health, you could be working in justice, you could be working in many different um, areas within the government. So if we move on to the next slide to give you some indication of my career. So you can see here, 2008 to 2012 was getting my degree at, at um, Strathclyde University. I have to be honest, I love, love maths, but wasn't particularly keen with kind of research. Um, so the PhD that I did and finished, um, it wasn't really what I really enjoyed. So when the government offered me a job, I thought, why not? I work for Scottish government and I've been there ever since. My first job with Scottish Government was input and output tables and they were responsible for creating tables to evidence in detail how the economy worked um, for sales and services and how that impacted on Scotland. I then moved into a different team still within government, still within business statistics and Again, variety of different types of work um, within that. When I was working for business and innovation teams, it could be how many businesses were in Scotland, it could be how many people were involved in those businesses, what the impact on Scotland was. So that was one area of work. That went on for quite a bit. And then I moved last year into accounting in bankruptcy, or AIB for short. Now, AIB is an agency, an executive agency of Scottish Government, and my role, my title is Lead Officer for Statistics. And I think it's easier if I kind of explain to you in simple terms, I'm responsible for collating all of the data within AIB. For example, I prepare any stats that are due to be published with regard to um, accounting and bankruptcy. Um, because we have to evidence very clearly to our colleagues what those statistics mean. We can't just produce figures and then give them to them. We have to explain what those figures mean and how they might impact legally. Then this year, and I don't have to tell you, do I, what happened this year? You all know what happened to us all this year. Um, because of COVID, there have been huge, huge changes. And since March... Um, the 
chief economic advisor, um, there was a degree of pressure on OSHA for short, or CEA. Um, there were lots and lots of demands from different departments of government to create statistics um, to evidence the impact of, of COVID. So we were seconded, some of us were seconded from AIB to support OCEA. Um, that went on for six months and we prepared data related to COVID. And then about a month ago, OCEA decided that they were able to support the work that they were needing to do by themselves. So we were released back into our own departments. So I came back to AIB instead of doing the dual role. Now what I'd like to show you is what is a typical working day at AIB. Well, this should be a typical working day at AIB. You can have a little read for yourself there. What I would normally do is see if any emails have come in. <clears throat> and then you can see the, the other areas that are on the screen. I would prepare and produce and publish a, a wide variety of stats. I would also quality assure them to make sure that they're fit for publication or fit for use. Once they're published, um, the most important thing is to communicate those um, pieces of information to people so that they can understand them. Because sometimes it's academic people who request the stats, sometimes it's managers or, or ministers, politicians. And that should be a typical working day. Now I say it should be because nothing ever happens like that on a typical day. There are so many other interruptions and interesting things to do. So on this next slide, you can see often people would ask me on a daily basis for freedom of information requests. And that's asking for specific pieces of information and I am duty bound to respond to them within 20 days, 20 working days. So the clock starts ticking as soon as um, a freedom of, freedom of information request arrives. So it could be that Parliament or a minister or anybody else for that matter wants a specific piece of information or a set of statistics um, for their daily work. So I have to prepare those also. And then the last one, guess what? Technology. And we all know, you know, having been so reliant on IT for so many months, I can give you a perfect example. This morning, I was IT dead in the middle of a conference for about three hours and couldn't get back to my work. So things like that happen all the time, but we have to cope with it and work through it. And I'm drawing towards the end now. What I would like to let you know, something that I hope will be useful for you to bear in mind within your future career. Now, Jenny has already explained, and I have already explained, that there is no one pathway for a mathematician. We've got lots of circuitous roads. And Naira and Zara as well, you can see that they've worked in many different areas, whether it's transportation, engineering, there are, and later on in, in this presentation, you will see other pathways for mathematicians. But I have to say, and Jenny's already mentioned this, you will never see a job advertised as wanted mathematician. What people often do want is a mathematician, but they don't advertise for it as such. What they want is somebody who has strong math skills and analytical skills, and that's where we come in. The final thing I would like to say to you is, it's a personal view, some who would, might disagree, but there are two key skills that I think it's vital that you have. The first is you've got to have the brain of a mathematician. You've got to think like a mathematician because most problems at the start need some form of understanding and some form of um, identifier so that we can solve a problem and how to identify how a problem can be solved. And a mathematical brain will help you to do that. And the second skill is communication really, communication. And it doesn't matter how brilliant a mathematician you are, if you can't communicate your findings or your work to your audience, you've wasted your time and effort. You have to be able to communicate your work to people who don't think like mathematicians, different disconnected groups of people who still want to know the answer. 
I hope you found that useful. Thank you for your time. I suspect there's a break next. I hope you've got a nice coffee and cake lined up and I'll pass back to Jenny. Thank you.